Um, welcome, Dr. Ajud. Hey, how are you? Good evening, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, so we can start today's talk. We can start the lecture. Everyone is ready? Perfect. Yes. So today's lecture will be about uh, two parts, actually. We'll start talking a little about anterior cutaneous fistula, and then we'll talk uh, about stomacher, like uh, highlights or summary about stomacher. Today's talk is about anterior cutaneous fistula, the first part. The definition of a fistula, it's an abnormal communication between two epithelized cervices. So in case of uh, communication between the bowel lumen and the skin, we call, the, we call it anterior cutaneous fistula. If the communication is between the bowel and the environment with absence of skin continuity, uh, we will call it anterior atmospheric fistula. Like the example is the, this picture. Why do we care? Because it's a devastating event for both patient and surgeon. Uh, it leads to a deteriorating muscle loss, neurological function for the patient, and it carries a mortality of 6% to 20%. So it's important. For the classification of an interocutaneous fistula, we can classify it according to anatomy, like on the basis of the affected segment. Is it uh, between the stomach and the skin, duodenum? Is it a uh, small bowel or large bowel, like colocutaneous fistula? And we can classify it according to etiology, uh, depending on the cause. Infectious cause, inflammatory cause, inflammatory including uh, inflammatory bowel disease, TB, diverticulitis, or uh, uh, like an infection like mycosis or salmonellosis. Uh, it could be etiogenic, postoperative, uh, in case of open abdomen. Uh, it can be after trauma, and it could be due to cancer or foreign body causing a perforation. We can classify it according to the output. In case of uh, a high output, usually uh, it's more than 500 ml per day. And this high output fistula is associated with severe electrolyte and nutritional abnormality. Low output, uh, usually it's less than 500 ml per day and actually low output fistula have a better chance of spontaneously closing or healing. So to talk about the phases of care of anterior cutaneous fistula when the, when the patient presents to you or to, to the clinic with the complaining of fistula, we can use the mnemonic SNAP. We first stabilize the patient, like if there's sepsis, we'll contour it. We'll, uh, we'll skin care, it's important. Nutrition. And then we'll evaluate the anatomy of the fistula. Evaluating the anatomy will help us address which surgery will be better for the patient and what chances he got for in healing. And we'll start planning our surgical procedure or a plan in case of failing of uh, spontaneously clo closure of the fistula. So to start with, we have to recognize we have an issue. The patient will present like this picture. He'll present with an open wound that is oozing a uh, bilious uh, fluid uh, this fluid will irritate the skin around it, and the uh, patient presenting with this fluid loss or volume loss, we need to restore uh, the blood volume lost. It's better to minimize the crystalloid fluids and start early with blood products like plasma or fresh frozen or coagulation factor, especially with patients with sepsis, because they may, experience, they may go into severe sepsis and require coagulation factor replacement. So we don't delay that. To recognize and stabilize the patient, uh, we need to recognize anything aggravating the fistula. For, for like, is, is the fistula causing uh, an abscess? Like you can see in this CT, uh, I cannot show you the abscess, but you can see a clear fistula of extravasation of the oral contrast from the small bowel to the skin. And if the patient is presenting with a high fever, you need to suspect that maybe he's having a collection that will need to be drained. Uh, if the patient presenting with the abscess, this will aggravate his losses. He may lose up to 500 grams of protein daily. We need to do a CT. It will define collection. It will define any distal intestinal obstruction that is aggravating the fistula. Uh, like in case of a patient with a distal obstruction due to cancer, this fistula will never heal unless we address the obstruction. We can do a fistulography, and if there is any abscess, 
uh, sometimes depending on the location because they may have uh, abscess very near or very close to the bowel, surgical drainage is better than aspiration. It depends on the anatomy of the abscess. Nutrition support is important. Uh, we need to start early. Like for nutrition assessment and replacement, we need to put a plan in the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we will start TBN early, even if the patient can tolerate uh, diet, he can eat. It's better to uh, include, like, include TBN in the management. They may lose up to 500 gram protein daily. That will lead to muscle loss and neurological dysfunction. Sometimes internal feeding will not, uh, internal feeding will not be uh, enough to make up the requirements that is lost. And usually the requirement is double that of a normal patient. They will need an 80 to 120 gram of protein daily. Their calories intake will double, it will increase. And we need to maintain a healthy diet, like uh, giving them 20% of fat. We need to replace the trace metal, the vitamins, and the fatty acid. And all this will aid in fistula healing. So by this time, we need to put a plan. If the fistula did not close up to 60 days, it means it will never close. The spontaneous closure usually happen in, the, in, in only 30, 35% of patients. That is third of the patients. An anatomy of the fistula will predict the closure. In case of a low fistula or a colonic fistula, usually it's more easier to, be, to close or it's easier to heal. A high output uh, in like in jejunum or ileum, it will be, or even in the stomach, it will be difficult to heal quickly. Sepsis will prevent closure, so we need to uh, address that and treat it if, it's, uh, if the patient has abscess or something that is preventing the healing. And be, be aware that the fistula may close and reopen again, so we need to start the whole cycle again. For the management plan, we can aid the closure, this spontaneous closure. We need to keep the edges protected and clean from any GI content. Um, Sometimes, like the picture, they use a, a, like a tube, a latex tube. They put it through the fistula and it will direct, uh, with a suction tube, it will direct all the fluid outside or away from the skin. Uh, we can use protection powders, adhesive barrier to the edge of the fistula to protect the skin. Sometimes it helps uh, using the ostomy bags. Okay. So this one example of an uh, interior atmospheric fistula uh, in an open abdomen, and actually they did not rush through operation. Uh, the rule is to operate if there is no closure in 60 days, but it's preferred, especially if it's not a cancer case or it's not, we don't have a distal obstruction, it is preferred to wait for at least six months uh, because of adhesion we allow it to, to, to be easier to handle during surgery. So we definitely uh, look at interior cutaneous fistula management as an elective operative approach. Like for example, they, in, this, in this patient, they give it time and skincare you use back uh, section to, uh, to make it less, um, to, to allow coverage of the fistula uh, and they give it time before they attack the fistula in a surgical approach. Uh, some rules for uh, that we for surgical repair of intercutaneous fistula. So we decided we're taking this patient to surgery. What we'll do next? Usually, the incision must start in a clean area to allow lysis of adhesion away from the fistula to avoid enterotomies. So if the patient having a fistula in the lower abdomen, it's better to start high up. You will mobilize the skin and the fascia early to allow coverage tissue, because usually these patients are in a bad nutritional status. Uh, you expect they're having a hernia. You expect you're gonna resect like part of the skin that is attached to the fistula. So you need to put in mind these steps early. You begin lysis of adhesion. So once you start opening the abdomen, you don't go, go to the area where the fistula is. You start first with giving like um, removing all the adhesions and, and allowing an access to the affected bowel. 
scissor dissection is safer, of course, than diathermy or blunt dissection. You free everything up before attacking the fistula. Bowel resection may be needed because uh, the area of the fistula that's affected, it will involve a small bowel with it or a colon. So you may need to um, resect that affected segment. For incision closure, you need to put in mind, like a case of open abdomen, you need to put in mind that you will require some abdominal wall reconstruction and you may need flap coverage. Okay. Sorry, the screen gets stuck, <laughs> don't worry. Okay, so it may take up to six and eight to eight hours. Be prepared and start early in the morning. No other procedure, no hurry. So I think the slide gets stuck on this comic. Let me just move it. Okay. And, yeah, the, the slides were stuck at this. <laughs> okay. So we talked about some surgical uh, key steps in attacking fistula. Um, this does not mean that the, the journey ends because next, if we didn't care, take good care of the skin and the post-operative patient, uh, some fistula may reoccur again. So put that in mind. You need to explain to your patient that he will need more time to, to return to work. He may need up to six months actually to gain the muscle function that he lost due to this uh, event. Don't rush over feeding. You just, you made the fresh anastomosis. You did a lot of adhesolysis in the area. You need to maintain the sufficient caloric and protein intake while in BO. So you will put the patient on TBN after that, maybe, maybe for two weeks. Physical rehabilitation is important because this fistula, you're not only losing fluid, you're losing protein. This will affect the patient losing, he will lose weight, he or she. They will have difficulty in, in, in uh, getting back up and, and being dependent again. You need to, uh, for assumption of function, you will need time. Um, so as I like due to protein loss, it may take up to one year and a half to, to regain neural function. So it's a long journey. Uh, the reason I'm talking about that because we in Adan Hospital we had our own special tiroatmospheric fistula. Uh, we presented the case report in uh, Aging Journal of uh, Case Report and Surgery uh, by Adan team, Dr. Khalil, Dr. Mohammed Shimali. Uh, I'm saying hi to them, <laughs> Dr. Maryam, Dr. Latifa, Dr. Majda, Dari, and Dr. Sana, Dr. Fatma. Uh, me, myself, and of course, Dr. Khalil. The reason I'm saying all this, because taking care of this special patient, it took literally the whole team to take care of her, starting from skin care to, to the surgical operation itself to the post-operative care. What was special about this patient that she had an heterogenic injury of the small bowel. Later, it was complicated with, a, with an open abdomen. She developed multiple enterocutaneous fistula with a high output and um, it took her a whole year of staying in the hospital on TBN to achieve like a good skin care or edge. We were able to um, shrink the size of the damage only to these areas. And we did the surgery in October, 2019. It was a long surgery, like maybe eight hours. We were able finally to close it, like reconstructed, it's beautiful. Next thing in post-operative day two, we were again facing another possible enterocutaneous fistula because you can see the damages that she had. She had again infection, um, the center of the wound won't heal and we had to graft it actually. She needed a whole month with hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, and we saw her in July 2020 with this. She ne almost needed a whole year and a half to return to her normal daily activities and be able to even walk. Okay, so the next part of the lecture, we are talking about stomach care. We finished talking about the enterocutaneous fistula, like in a summary, how to 
uh, tackle a patient with this issue. For the next talk, we'll talk about specifically about stoma. What is stoma? It's an externalized artificial opening of the intestine, whether small or large, to the anterior abdominal wall to divert stool. If it's in the small bowel, we'll call it an ileostomy. If it's a large bowel, we'll call it a colostomy. So bear in mind that stoma can be done at any level, but there are preferred levels to serve a clinical purpose. Like for example, for the small bowel, it's best to do it at the end of the, of the terminal ileum. And for the colon, it's best to be done at the descending colon to be beneficial for the patient. It's related to anatomical uh, reasons. So as we said, the stoma is an artificially created opening of the intestine to the abdominal wall. It can be temporary or permanent, serving a, a specific purpose. Um, in this part, we'll talk specifically about ileum and uh, proc ileostomy because it needs a more, uh, more special surgical steps than creating a colostomy. The benefits of creating a stoma, whether it's a colostomy or a eostomy, uh, it has to aim. Either we have a distal pathology, we're trying to divert the content away. Um, and the other step that maybe, we, the other aim, maybe we have an anastomosis. Distally, we created that anastomosis and we need to protect it. So we also divert that content away. So it can be temporary, it can be permanent. So when do we create a stoma? Depending on the reasons. It can be because of congenital anomalies, colon obstruction, inflammatory bowel disease, intestinal trauma, uh, or uh, GI cancer. Uh, this slide, uh, I put this slide to differentiate, like it's for the clinical examination, basically. Uh, if, you, if you had a patient with a stoma and the examiner asked you or in real life, you want to know, is it an ileostomy or a colostomy? You can differentiate between the two by three steps. First, by the location. Um, if the stoma is, uh, is on the right, usually it's an ileostomy. On the left, it's a colostomy. And uh, you should know that stoma always is brought through the rectus muscle. So it's either on the left or, or the right of the umbilicus. It's almost always through the rectus muscle. It's very rare to find a stoma in the center or like in the pelvic area. Um, we can differentiate by the content, the consistency, and the volume. Uh, in case of ileostomy, because it's, it's more bilish, uh, high output, uh, watery, it's coming from the small intestine. If it's a colostomy, usually it's like a stool-like, semi-solid, brownish, low volume. And this will affect actually the management later, like for the patient with the ileostomy, uh, the care is little different than patient with colostomy, but the principle are the same. Uh, the shape of the stoma, if it's spouted, spouted meaning like an inversion of the mucosa, uh, usually it's an ileostomy. So you'll find the stoma above the skin. I have pictures later to show. You'll find it above the skin level to protect the skin from bile effect. So the, the fluid will go through the bag, the, but the flushed, Usually is a colostomy. You'll find it at the same level of the skin. Uh, also, we can classify it by shape. So if it's, if it's a one loop or one opening, usually it's an end. If it's uh, end stoma or end oleostomy, if it's two lumen or two ends, usually it's a loop or a diverting stoma. Um, an endoleostomy, so we, we said we, it can be temporary, it can be permanent. It can be an end, uh, like endoleostomy, it can be a loop diverting stoma. In case of an end stoma with only one opening, it's the preferred shape for a permanent ileostomy. It's easier to manage. It allows for a symmetrical and protruding spout that is more easily constructed and managed. Uh, it's usually created when the distal intestine is not suitable for restoration of intestinal continuity due to a disease or poor intestinal function. So you're not thinking about going back to OT to reverse it. Typical scenario of an end of a use of an endoleostomy will be like a, 
so many so many examples for example like patient with inflammatory bowel disease who had a total proctocolectomy so uh, you end up with small intestine uh, or you did um, like you have a patient with fecal incontinence and uh, the colon is not functional or cases of congenital anomalies so we did not do an anastomosis or reconstruction of the distal pathway in case of a temporary or a diverting lobeliostomy, it's usually created to divert uh, the stool. It's used to decompress the distal bowel. So you can see that they, there is two ends for the bowel. The bowel was, uh, was left in continuity and it will be easier for later to just like uh, restore this continuity by opening above, like we, they open above the stoma and they re this part only without going to uh, for a laboratory. So it's easier to reconnect. So for example, we have a low anastomosis, like a low distal anastomosis, and we need to protect this anastomosis, give it a time to heal, we'll create a diverting global ostomy. So many examples. For like, uh, for example, I just mentioned a few on the slide. Uh, there is a distal ileal or colonic stomosis that is a high risk of disruption. There is a rectal trauma, and you will need to give time for the rectal trauma to heal. So you divert the stool away. Uh, you did a, like a reconstruction of the anal sphincter. You want to give it time to heal. Uh, you had an obstructing colorectal cancer that you can't operate on. You can't take out the cancer, so you do a diversion till the patient maybe receive a chemotherapy or radiation. In cases of sacral decubitus ulcer, you want to direct the stool away from the, the sacral ulcer, give it time to heal. Or in case of necrotizing perineal soft tissue infection, which is not related to the bowel. You just need, uh, like, it's, it will be difficult for the patient to um, to be exposed, the, the ulcer will be exposed to stool. So we need to divert it away for like two months, three months, give it time to heal and then go back and reconstruct the bowel. So we'll talk a little about stoma. The, we talked about the types, we talked about the benefit or the aim. The ideal stoma will have no necrosis Will have no necrosis, it will have no prolapse, and uh, there will be no retraction. The daily output usually range from 500 to uh, one liter. This is the, the normal perfect stoma. The appliance does not leak and the skin is healthy. So that is our aim when we create a stoma. Creating a stoma start in the perioperative um, period. It starts with a good patient selection, like the patient need to be mentally fit or, or understanding at least for the uh, importance of the stoma. If the patient has any problems, you need to be sure that he has a, another caregiver that will understand how to take care of the stoma. Patient assessment, does the patient have any other comorbidities to, to tackle? And stoma education, like we actually need to sit with the patient and teach him or, or at least tell him what he, uh, he or she will expect from having a stoma. And all this starts in the preoperative area. This is, of course, if we have time for an elective stoma. Uh, even in emergency situation, we need to prepare the patient mentally that the stoma is important. So it's very hard for the patient to wake up and suddenly find he, ha he, he has like a bag attached with a stool in it. So it's important to educate the patient. So we'll talk a little about each step. In the preoperative planning, it's important to assess the patient comorbidity and um, uh, is the patient able to perform activities of daily living, self-care, mobility, uh, especially his body control. Like an obese patient, there are special care compared to thin uh, patients. Discussion with the patient about the proposed ileostomy procedure the alternative and post-operative lifestyle. The patient need to understand why he was chosen to, to get an ileostomy. Ideally, the patient must be mentally and physically ready for a stoma and must therefore be informed as early as possible. 
in case the patient like need special care or the patient have a, a caregiver, we need to educate the caregiver about it also. For stoma education, they found that uh, they did studies and they found that a good preoperative education program, it decreased readmission rate, decreased complication related to dehydration, appliance problem, it optimized the post operative patient satisfaction and participation in activities of daily life. So we'll talk a little about stoma site marking because it's important. Uh, it will affect uh, the rate of complication, uh, prevent leakage. Uh, we need to really like think about it and assess the patient, the body contour of the patient. It's better to mark it before the surgery, not while the patient is lying flat on the OT table. The optimal location uh, is through, as we said, through the rectus muscle. Uh, because bringing the stoma through the rectus muscle, you are using the the, mus the muscle to like re decrease the rate of hernia in the future. So you don't do it too lateral. You don't do it in the midline near the wound. You do it uh, in the rectus sheet or rectus muscle. You need to assess the patient standing, sitting, bending. You, you need to see the, the, the folds, the skin folds. Uh, where does the patient, uh, the waist of the patient, like his clothes, where does it sit on his, uh, on his or her body, his range of motion. It's important for the patient to visualize the stoma that he can actually take care of it. Uh, for example, a patient who is in a wheelchair, we need to think about it and put the stoma in a higher place. So this is the picture. We can see that the perfect place is through the rectus muscle to minimize varsomal herniation. It's at the bottom median infra umbilical fat pad. You're trying to avoid the umbilicus, avoiding the bone scars, avoiding uh, skin folds. And uh, if the patient is obese, you need to avoid the abdominal banai. Okay, the next few slides is a little long, but I'll try to explain each step. Uh, this is like this, the creation of an endoleostomy, especially the BROC endoleostomy. It has special surgical steps that you need to be able to understand and actually explain. Um, the reason we spout the endoleostomy because of the, the fluid content. It's liquidy, it's pilous, it's a high volume, it will affect the skin around it. So the perfect one is an inverted spout shape endoleostomy. The surgical steps in summary, we start with our what, usual midline laparotomy, attacking whatever it's a cancer, it's inflammatory bowel disease, any resection and stomosis need to be done. We finish from that. Then the next step will be an ileal bowel limb mobilization. We need to mobilize the, the, the bowel that we will use to use our stoma. It need to be tension free. And then the skin itself need to be prepared. The abdominal wall apparatus creation because it will go through the rectus muscle. And the stoma maturation, which is creating the inverted spout shape uh, broken and deleostomy. Okay, so uh, as I said, we start first as regular laparotomy. We're doing our bowel resection. Uh, we need to mobilize the ileum to make it tension free. The most important steps are the stoma side skin incision. We start with a circular skin incision of two centimeters. It should be two centimeters, so it won't be tight over the stoma. Um, you divide the subcutaneous fat and then you go to the anterior, you will visualize the anterior of the sheet. You incise it in a crochet fashion, like a cross, one centimeter in both direction. You're giving, you're giving space for the stoma. You split the rectus muscle, it's important. You split it, you don't cut it. You split bluntly to expose the posterior rectus sheath and peritoneum. The rectus muscle is not divided, are not divided. Why? Because you're trying to keep the muscle or the function of the muscle around the stoma, as we said, to prevent hernia or try to decrease the cases of bursomal hernia. Okay. 
Next is the limb itself, how to uh, prepare it for a stoma. You create a defect in the posterior of the sheath. You widen the defect. You, you need to at least put two fingers inside it to, because the stoma need to pass without compromising its mesenteric blood supply. You don't need anything to, 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 to tighten around the stoma. It will cause necrosis if it's tight. The appropriate defect size is obtained by digitally dilating the stoma site with the tips of two digits to create a two centimeter uh, breacher. Okay, so next you create, you inside the skin, you created your defect or your opening. Inside the abdomen, you need at least a six centimeter of a viable distal terminal ileum. It's important that it's viable. You need to test uh, the color, the, the uh, blood supply because anything or any um, ha bad handling of the mesentery will co may cause a necrosis of the stoma. So the mesentery should not be struck. You keep good six centimeter mesentery. You handle it gently. You avoid hematoma. You avoid vascular injury because all this will affect your end stoma. Then the ileum is advanced through the defect and you bring it because Bear in mind, you're gonna spout it, you're gonna avert it. So you need four centimeter above the skin. If it's too bulky, you can remove some of the fat. Okay. Uh, inside the abdomen, you secure it to the peritoneum. So it would like uh, withhold the tension. It will prevent torsion retraction prolapse. Uh, also bear in mind that you're doing an endoliostomy. So the distal cut end that you're gonna keep inside, uh, you need to tag it in case in the future, the patient will undergo a reconstruction or re It's to help the next surgeon. Okay, so you finish your creation of stoma. You open the abdomen, you did your resection, you incise the skin, you prepare the defect. You still did not open the stoma. You just brought the stoma to the skin. You need to prevent wound contamination because you're opening the stoma, which is full of stool. You need to cover your original or like your laboratory wound first. And the most important step is stoma maturation. Uh, you take bites from, from the dermis, and then you take bites in the mucosa. You take it to the four quadrant, and then you repeat another stitch in between, up to eight stitches. The aim is to prevent any, mu any mucosal island. So you're trying to avoid contamination uh, of the skin. You're trying to avert the sp or spout the stoma in order to direct the fluid away from the skin to avoid skin irritation. Okay, so the end, I hope it's clear in the picture that the, the end result is a healthy, viable uh, protruded stoma that rise two centimeter beyond the skin level when completed. So that was in summary, like the surgical steps, how to create an endoliostomy and the most important steps. You finish and then you apply your appliance. Usually the appliance, it's either one piece or two piece. Like in the picture, there are two pieces. One is an adhesive face plate that has a central opening. The other one is a collection bag. So this is two piece leostomy. And make sure that uh, the central cut or the edges of the cut, uh, it should be one to two millimeter away from the edges of the leostomy to avoid trauma or leakage uh, from the leostomy. So as I mentioned, you have uh, one piece or two piece. Uh, usually one piece is more flexible to use. Um, two piece, uh, it is good, but uh, if you're able to see it in your hospital or on the ward, uh, two piece usually is more tough to handle. Uh, the plastic part is little like, you cannot bend it. You will see later the importance of choosing, like why are you advising your patient to change the regular two piece into one piece. 
like for obese patient, one piece is better because it's more flexible. It's easier to uh, attach to the skin. It will take the contour of the body. So I talk about post-operative care. Um, you need to give time for the stoma. Uh, it will function usually within three days, the first three days. Uh, usually it start functioning with a high output till uh, the ileum uh, adjust the, its physiology and start uh, absorbing water. Uh, the effluent will thicken and the ideal daily effluent volume is 500 to one liter in ileostomy. In colostomy, it should be less even, it should be like around 500. Uh, don't forget about appropriate hydration because the patient will lose a lot of fluid. Uh, make sure of the electrolyte level. Expect that your patient will lose sodium, will lose potassium, magnesium, calcium. Uh, the, uh, the replacement can be through oral uh, route or you, can, you may need uh, IV route to replace the electrolyte. Expect that some patient will need help to thicken the enteric content. We can use uh, xylem, which is uh, a thickened material. The patient may need uh, anticholinergic agent to decrease the ileostomy output. We have so many options to use. We may use an opioid receptor agonist like lobramide. We may use, uh, use a bile acid binder like cholesteramine or even narcotic agent. Uh, the best usually is to start step by step. So you start first with a thickened thickening uh, drug and then if it's not responding you start adding uh, like lubromide you start adding the anticholinergic agent to it, until you reach the good volume of 500 to 1 liter you will uh, see your patient uh, assess how he's dealing with the stoma while he's bending while he's sleeping he's walking some patients, especially obese patients, may need more support. There is support belts available to secure uh, the appliance. Um, it's important to maintain a healthy skin around the stoma. And use the correct adjacent or using like powder or drills available to avoid breakdown of the skin. We educate the patient about how to, like, how to deal with the stoma. Uh, we usually advise the patient for frequent change of the back. Uh, don't, we tell him once his third full, you need to change it because if, if he left it till it become half full, it will be heavy, it will pull on the appliance, it may leak. So the perfect like number is third full. The appliance should be changed if the patient is experiencing leakage or peristomal skin problem. Otherwise, the face plate that can it, it can be put up to seven days if there is no leakage or skin irritation, but the bug must be changed whenever it's third fold. So I'll skip the question for now. We'll talk more about uh, the answers during the lecture. Okay. So the last part of this talk is about complication of stoma. There is either an immediate or uh, um, early or late complication. Usually a very early complication, meaning the first five days or first week of, of, of post-operative period, um, it's from a technical failure. Uh, for, for example, a separation or a twist or an obstruction, it will need a stoma revision operation. Uh, so as we said, complication can be early or late, depending on the time. Usually any complication that happened before three months, we call it an early complication. Uh, complication happening after three months, it's more related to the shape of the stoma. Usually it's a late complication. We'll talk, we'll talk about them one by one. The most common problem includes skin irritation. It's, it can happen up to 60% of the patient. It's related either to a fixation issue or a leakage that's causing uh, irritation of the skin. As example, this picture, causing dermatitis. Okay, it will cause skin peeling. It will be very painful. 
and uh, this actually this complication is related to the stoma formation itself um, as i said like before we need to really think and plan our site it should be away from skin crease it should be away from scars bony promises uh, accessible to the patient uh, sometimes the patient will need special help. Like for example, you can see this, um, our usual, our usual faceplate or our usual ileostomy is a flat one. And this area, it has like convexity in it. It will push the stoma or push the skin around the stoma, uh, allowing for more pressure. So the, the effluent or the fluid will collect in the bag. Uh, the patient may need uh, special care from skin barrier, like powder, spray, or paste. There's a lot of product available in the market that can be applied around the skin, and uh, it will help clearing the irritation. It will protect the surface of the skin. Uh, and if there's any infection, we need to use antifungal or antibacterial ointment around the skin. Another complication is necrosis. It's, it's, necrosis is an early complication. It will appear in the first three months. Uh, the most important step, like if you are faced with a stoma that is necrotic, it looks dusky, it doesn't look good, looks black, you will evaluate the damages. So you want to know is this necrosis is superficial or deep? You will insert a test tube, like regular test tube, put it through the stoma, flashlight, and look you will visualize the mucosa. Another alternative of using the test tube is a, you can use a flexible sigmoidoscopy or lightened inoscope. The management will depend on what you will find. If the necrosis extend to the proximal uh, bowel below the anterior fascia, you found a, a long segment of, uh, of uh, necrosis, this means it will need an immediate revision. If you found the skin or the stenosis is only above the fascia, it's very superficial, and the segment of the bowel behind it is uh, good and healthy and pink, you can give the patient time, you observe it. If there's any sloughing, maybe gentle debridement, and bear in mind that this will result, the stenosis will put the stoma at risk of retraction, it will put the stoma at risk of stenosis later. You give, you give patient time. And if the necrosis is progressing, you need the revision. So the first step in a superficial uh, stenosis is to wait. Another form of complication is in dehydration. Uh, in case of high output ileostomy, that is more than one liter and a half. The patient may lose uh, fluid, electrolyte, lose fat, soluble vitamin, and you need to replace the volume, replace the electrolyte. The patient may require admission, and they will need an anti-motility agent or bulk forming laxative to decrease the output and decrease the losses. We'll talk about the late complication. Uh, in this picture, you can see a prolapsed stoma. The prolapsed stoma actually is experiencing some form of ulceration because of the pressure. Uh, prolapse is still scoping of the intestine out from the stoma. Uh, if the patient is at home, we can instruct him to put an osmotic agent like table sugar or honey. If he's in the hospital, we can apply a gauze with hypertonic saline and then manually reduce it. If it's good and well, we can just continue using this conservative approach if it's causing skin ulceration, uh, sorry, it's ca causing stoma ulceration or causing it's so severe that it's causing actual obstruction, the patient may need a revision. So the first step is conservative. Other complication like retraction stenosis. Uh, in this picture, you can see the stoma is retracted. It's below the skin level. They will need a special type, the one uh, I explained earlier, the convex fitting. A face plate which will push the skin around it and it will allow the fluid to come out instead of collecting in the skin causing a problem. The stenosis may cause obstruction and it's more common in patients with colostomy. 
uh, actually patient with colostomy may require a regular irrigation with whether fleet enema or warm saline. We need to educate them like uh, they may need monthly irrigation with warm water because the content is uh, more solid. One of the most important complications that we can actually fix it surgically is a barostomal hernia. It may occur up to 50% of the patient. Um, if the patient's coming only not seeing a bulge, but this bulge is not affecting his life, he's able to put the appliance, he's not having any obstruction, uh, the, the, the first step is a conservative step. We can uh, use a binder like uh, to push the hernia inside. Uh, or we can use the flexible botching system. It's the one piece I was explaining earlier uh, that will fit to the body contour of the patient. If the patient is presenting in, in, in an acute fashion, like he's presenting with obstruction or um, the hernia is too big that is interfering with his uh, fit of appliance or his quality of life, we will need to do a formal hernia repair. They found out that using a mesh is better than using a primary uh, hernia repair. So for options of hernia repair, I'll just put a picture. Yeah, so in this picture, we have several options to treat a hernia, parastomal hernia. They used to talk about relocating the stoma, but they found out that relocating the stoma actually is not beneficial because you have your initial stoma site that you will fix the hernia in it, but you put another site at risk. So relocating the stoma is not the best up-to-date uh, management that we go to. You will find it written in books, but actually relocating the stoma will put the new site at risk of another peristomal hernia. So you did not fix the issue. Uh, another option is a direct repair of the defect. They open over the stoma. They don't relocate it. They, they use the same stone, stoma, but they close the defect with uh, permanent suture. They found there is a high risk of uh, recurrence up to 16%, can be higher. Another option is uh, a subcutaneous mesh repair or what we call it an onlay. Onlay meaning that it's above the fascia. Above the fascia, we're just gonna open a flap near the uh, stoma. We find the rectus abdominis muscle and we apply a, a mesh over it, like fixing a hernia. It's good, but still it carry a risk of uh, hernia recurrence. The best one, was a uh, sublay. A sublay, actually you will reach the posterior fascia or the muscle compartment. You will create a flap from the rectus muscle and the mesh will go under the rectus muscle. It will not be above the rectus fascia. Uh, another option is intraperitoneal. This is more for laparoscopic hernia repair. Uh, an intraperitoneal mesh that will be applied from inside it will be a better option. But intraperitoneal mesh, meaning that you're using a, a special type of mesh that will be uh, temporary or degradable because you cannot use the brolin, regular brolin mesh inside the abdomen in contact with bowel. Okay, uh, so for the onlay mesh, that uh, it's easier to be done it's an easy surgery. Uh, you just apply the mesh anterior to the rectus or external oblique fascia. Um, it's technically straightforward. It avoids an intra-abdominal dissection, but the recurrence is still up to 17%. A sublay, which is the best management for barostomal hernia, uh, is uh, putting the mesh below the fascia and the muscular layer. So you dissect you continue dissection until you reach the very peritoneal space and you apply a mesh. Another option is the intra-abdominal approach, like through the laparoscope, it has a few recurrence, 7%. Seven, 7%. So again, here like in a different diagram, they're explaining the different options. And onlay, meaning 
you have your rectus abdominis muscle, you put a mesh over it. The supply, which is the perfect one because it prevents uh, like relocation or movement of the mesh. Um, you dissect, you find your rectus muscle and you create like a flap or a bucket under the muscle and you apply the mesh. We'll go back. Yeah. Intraperitoneal is like through laparoscopic, you apply the mesh directly beneath the peritoneum, but it needs a special kind of mesh, biological mesh. And this is an example of an intraperitoneal mesh. It's a special biological mesh. You can like, you open the whole abdomen and you apply it from inside. For now, what I explained before was an open uh, technique or it was toward, uh, we're not opening the abdomen, we're keeping the peritoneum intact. In case we want to apply an intraperitoneal mesh, which is the last option, we have two ways of, um, and this is for our surgical resident, we have two ways of fixing that mesh, that intraperitoneal mesh. Uh, we can, the best one is the sugar baker. The sugar baker technique, he will put part of the mesh around the loop. So the loop of the bowel forming the ostomy, it's brought around the mesh. So you have a secure, secured mesh around it. Keyhole technique, it's, it's a keyhole. You're creating a defect, a circle defect, and the loop is going through that defect, and it's free to move, and you close your mesh. They found that sugar baker has a better uh, or less less chance of, of peristomal uh, recurrence. So this is the different uh, types of how to fix an intraperitoneal mesh. It's different than the only or the sublay that we talked about. Okay, this I think the last part of the lecture. Sorry if I'm taking a long time explaining. Um, so if a patient came to you uh, looking like this, and she had a history of Crohn's or inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, for, for first it looks like a bad skin reaction, it looks like a bad dermatitis, but this patient will tell you, she tried everything in the market, she went to the most experienced nurse, she put powder, she put gel, and it's getting worse. So you have to think about a condition called periostomal bioderma gangliosum. It's a very painful lesion, and the treatment, uh, it will require resuming her biological treatment and giving her corticosteroid and giving her anti-inflammatory medication or, or, or a male patient. Because the MCQ had a lady in it, so that's why I'm relating to it. So to talk a little about peristomal bioderma gangliosum. The picture will be um, like a very bad skin reaction that is very painful. Uh, usually it's a neutrophilic dermatosis with unclear etiology, but the problem with it that even with a skin biopsy, uh, it will not be able to diagnose it. Like you can take a skin biopsy and the skin biopsy will come back as a normal skin. So skin biopsy is not the preferred method to diagnose it. You only diagnose it as a guess, like with a patient with a history of inflammatory bowel disease and the skin is not healing up, uh, you, may give her, you may give the patient a trial of anti-inflammatory uh, drugs. One way to avoid this is like in case of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is to select an uninfected segment of bowel uh, for the stoma, it's the best way to prevent complication. So the bowel should be healthy, that is used for the stoma. And they may need a systemic or an intralesional or topical anti-inflammatory agent, biological treatment, or corticosteroid. Okay, I think I finished my talk. This last slide is from basically medical students. Like if you are faced with a patient uh, in, in a clinical exam or in your daily rounds, having a stoma, how to approach it, you need to start as a general examination. You look at the patient, is he conscious, is he oriented, is he obese, his nutrition status, and then you pay a closer look at the stoma. As any clinical examination, you start with your inspection and your palpation. Your inspection, you look at the site. The site will help you differentiate, just to, to recap, will help you differentiate between an ileostomy and a colostomy. We said ileostomy is on the right, colostomy is on the left. You look at the mucosa. 
the perfect one is a pink and healthy. And then you see the opening, you actually open the, the apparatus, you open the phalange and look how many openings is there, one or two lumen. One will be an endoleostomy or a colostomy. Two lumen will be a diverting ileostomy or a diverting colostomy. You look at the mucosa, is it spouted, averted, ileostomy, or it's flushed, skin level, colostomy. You check if there is any prolapse, there is any retraction, you comment on the skin surrounding the stoma, if any scars, and then uh, you have to mention the bug. Is it what type of a bug is used? Is it one, on one piece, two piece? Uh, you look at the fluid or the effluent. What is the color? What is the output? It will help you differentiate between leostomy and colostomy. Uh, you can judge the volume. Is it too much? Is it more than one liter and a half? Or is it a good amount? And then your palpation, you palpate for a parastomal hernia, you ask the patient to cuff. It can be obvious as a bulge, or you may have to ask the patient to strain, and you allow a finger to pass through. Usually it's not painful to do that, you just do it gently. Uh, you make sure there is no stenosis or structure. And that's it, I think I finished. Well, yeah, found it. 10 questions, okay. Uh, why ileum had high output fluid, mom? It's because when it reached the colon, the output is more solid. Yeah, so basically he answered why ileum has a high output. Because you lost your function of water reabsorption of the colon. So the usual fluid from the ileum is a liter. Okay, uh, next question. When do we create a loop stoma? What all? Okay, I mentioned that, that we need to divert the stool away. So it's a, like more of a temporary solution uh, in case we have, uh, there was a slide with a whole bunch of scenarios, like in case of erectile trauma, you're not gonna, uh, the, like you're not gonna resect anything. You, did the, you, you uh, fix the issue and you need to give it time to heal or uh, a distal anastomosis that is low. You know that anastomosis on the left side is more prone of uh, leakage. So you need to protect your stoma, or sorry, your anastomosis. So you create a loop stoma to give it time to heal. So usually loop stoma is created in a condition that you have a distal anastomosis that is a high risk of breakdown, whether it's sepsis or radiation or uh, a difficult low uh, anastomosis. One option that, as I mentioned, like decubitus ulcer, uh, you don't want to resect anything from the bowel. You just want to divert the stool away from, from the ulcer. Okay, next question. What should be avoided in fistula? Victoria, one more question, yeah. Yeah, it's not clear. What should be avoided, like what? What should be avoided? Like, um, I can I the, same person, the same person asked what food should be avoided in a fistula. It's not related to food, basically. Nothing is restricted. You, you, act, you need to, the most important thing, you start with MTBN to uh, replace the protein loss because regular food will not be enough, but nothing to be avoided. Can a fistula heal without surgery? Yes, we mentioned that 30% of the fistula may heal without surgery. Usually a low output, uh, low fistula of the colon will heal without, without surgery. Could you explain the diverting globulostomy? Okay. Uh, um, they have a trouble with diverting globulostomy. Okay, diverting globulostomy. It means we have a problem distally and you don't want to lose the continuity, like you're not resecting anything and you need to divert the stool for a while till this distal pathology is solved. This distal issue can be a fresh anastomosis that you're trying to avoid, uh, a rectal trauma you're trying to heal, an ulcer you're trying to give it time to heal, so you're, you're diverting the stool away. And you're putting in your mind that there is a plan for reconstruction. So this diverted loop can be just resected and anastomosis later, it will be easier to, um, to reconstruct, reconstruct. I don't know if this answers your question. Is Brie of enema or valve evacuation is done? Uh, actually, to answer the question, 
the current studies show that there's like actually no value of of pre op enema, but sometimes you may need it. So I cannot give you an answer actually. Pre op enema or valve evacuation is done usually in elective setting, I would say yes, but in an emergency setting, it does not affect the outcome. If we use anti motility drugs for decreased output, will it not cause paralytic ileus and obstructing colon? But the patient already having a high output ileostomy. So you start with a low dose and you titrate it up. And if the goal of a low output stoma is achieved, you stop the medicine. Sometimes they may need the medicine for only three days. We're not talking about a chronic use of medication here. Uh, kindly shine some light on sugar baker technique. Side effects, no, <laughs> thank you. That will need a lot, like, I'm sorry, I can't answer the side effects of sugar baker because uh, I need more slides to explain, you know? Thank you, Victoria. Uh, thank you for this collaboration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very I much. I was able to answer most of the question. Yeah, okay. no, that's, that's, yeah. that's good. Um, okay. so so I would just like, thank you very much, Dr. Rajud, for this lecture. I, I, I'm sure it was very beneficial and very eye-opening. Um, so before everyone leaves, I just, um, I just want to kindly say that thank you all for joining our lectures, um, our Surgical Fix lectures. This is the last of our, of our series. Um, we would love to see you back for more sessions in the future. Uh, we have more courses coming up, more sessions coming up. Just uh, stay tuned on our social media accounts. Um, and you guys have been the highlight of our Surgical Fix program. So thank you guys so much for attending. Um, we really appreciate it. And don't forget to fill the survey. And thank you, Dr. Rajud. Thank, thank you very you, much you. for the lecture. Thank, thank you. you for the whole team. Thank you. Thank you.